Why does education matter? Really, why do we spend the first 18 to 25 years of our lives in classrooms? Isn't that kind of strange? When you stop to think about it, most of what you learn isn't useful for most people in most situations. Sure, some of us go on to work in technical fields, but most of us don't. Most of us have to rely on skills that we don't learn in school. Social engagement, negotiation, career planning, strategic development, critical thinking, even doing your taxes. None of these are taught in a classroom setting, at least not in most schools. So why is it that we're told to stay in school? Three reasons, status, wealth, and power. But that's not something we're supposed to say out loud. If you ask a teacher or a parent why school matters, they'll probably give you some stock answers. It's about understanding the world around you, thinking for yourself, working with others, developing a love for learning. But that just doesn't check out. History classes barely scratch the surface of what makes the world tick, often forcing students to memorize dates and places rather than develop a coherent narrative of human progress. STEM and humanities classes from primary school all the way up to university mainly consist of grouping students into a room to be lectured at until even the most passionate learners feel burnt out. That sounds a lot more like a love for self-harm than a love of learning. And thinking for yourself? Really? What part of the educational system encourages free thinking or challenging the status quo? Look, the bottom line is we go to school for three reasons status, wealth, and power. We knew that back in 1838. Here's a refresher for the year 2024, according to Henry Adams. Adams hit the jackpot from day one. He had not one, not two, but three presidents in his lineage. Not only was he a direct descendant of John and John Quincy Adams, but also of Nathaniel Gorham, president of the Continental Congress during the 1780s. Henry Adams lived from beginning to end, knowing that he could do whatever he wanted. His wealth, social capital, and most of all, his name could never be overspent. Henry grew up sitting in the lap of his grandfather, John Quincy Adams, listening to the stories of his great-grandfather, the John Adams. From John Quincy, the young Henry learned everything from European history to the American Revolution. His president relative taught him how to read and encouraged him to keep pursuing knowledge. So he did. Henry Adams kept learning and growing. He stayed in school. He went to Harvard. He taught at Harvard. He wrote one of the most historically extensive and most important histories of the United States. But none of it was enough. Adams received an earned more status than just about anyone else. He was a historian, a presidential descendant, advisor to the president, but none of it mattered. Through his education, he learned as much as he could, but he was never satisfied. So at the ripe old age of 68, Adams set out to write his life story. More than his life, he wrote about his education. He needed to. After attaining more status through his work than most people could ever dream of, Adams kept working until the day he died, trying to figure out not just the meaning of life, but the meaning of learning itself. But knowledge is more than a tool for gaining status. Knowledge pays the bills. Although Adams had no need for wealth, in his own words, he never got to the point of playing the game at all, but he lost himself in the study of it, watching the errors of the players. Adams did as he pleased. He lounged around in Europe, traveling from Germany to Italy to Switzerland and back across through the US. He studied at prestigious universities around the world. None of it added up. As he gained wealth and spent it liberally, Adams became more and more cynical. After years of vagabonding, he journeyed back home for good, with mixed emotions, but no education. At this point in his 20s, Adams knew more than his father, or his grandfather, or his great-grandfather had known. But knowing lots of facts and spending lots of money did not make him happy, so Adams pursued higher values. He kept studying to become a lawyer, all the while wondering whether the boy of the mid-1800s stood nearer to the year 1904 or to the year 1. He found himself unable to give a sure answer. But even as he approached law school, Adams still doubted the practical value of his education. Looking back, Adams knew the education he had received bore little relation to the education he needed. Because luckily for him, and unluckily for everybody else, in the rapidly changing world of the 1860s, 1861 marked the start of the U.S. Civil War. And war can only mean one thing for a man of educated status and wealth. Power. Education grants men of great means even greater means. Because when Adams looked beyond the trivial rewards of job security, higher salary, and career opportunities, he found another reason to stay in school, the pursuit of power. To Adams, power was universal. Henry Adams was assistant advisor to his father, who in turn advised Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. Needless to say, the Civil War was a mess. For all parties involved, little was learned, many lives were lost, but progress was slowly being made. 
the case of Henry Adams, next to no power was acquired from being held in political favor. Not Lincoln, not Johnson, not Grant offered Adams a free ride to political mastery. In the realm of governmental hijinks, Henry Adams had failed to acquire any useful education. Knowledge of human nature is the beginning and end of political education. But if you're looking for more answers from Henry Adams, you're looking in the wrong place. Adams lived through a string of strings of failure. Henry Adams could see easy ways of making a hundred blunders. He could see no likely way of making a legitimate success. Such as it was, his so-called education was wanted nowhere. As he grew older and lived on to the 20th century, Adams became bitter. His jaded viewpoints on the educational system only grew more cold and informed with time. So he lived on, writing historical documents, earning praise, and even winning a posthumous Pulitzer for his autobiography. But what did he really learn? What can we learn from all of this? Let me ask you again, why does education matter? If you ask Henry Adams, the point is to clear away the obstacles in life, to apply effort to your development, and to grow beyond what you're told to do. Adams may have failed to reach his dreams, but he left us some important lessons. He taught us that status, wealth, and power alone are not enough to be happy. No amount of presidential greetings, familial trust funds, or travels abroad will make you into a better person. But by educating yourself, you can find something richer than the three pursuits we've talked about until now. Because there's one more reason why we tell our kids to stay in school. Most of us never get there. Schools often make learning painful, boring, and forgettable. But there's still hope, because reading one great story, solving one difficult problem or puzzle, developing one new skill, these actions do make us happy. When we motivate our pursuits with intrinsically valuable goals, it doesn't matter how much money we make, it doesn't matter whether we earn a degree, a title, a certificate, or a medal, it doesn't matter how well we score on someone else's exam. Life is ungraded, and participation is voluntary. At the end of the day, the point of education is to get us to think for ourselves, live our own lives, and find the subjects worth learning about. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful night.